Right. <clears throat> okay. Well, in my lecture today, which is um, oops, now why are we going on to that? Um, which is really in connection with the um, is to sort of not commemorate or to go alongside the fact that um, the IHBC is meeting in Aberdeen. And what I want to do, what I've been asked to do, is to set a, a very broad historical um, context for Aberdeen's tower blocks. Um, I'm really a historian of post-war housing and with projects that have included most recently this book in the middle there that uh, Mark just mentioned, which was published uh, last year, um, telling the story of mass housing at a global level. But And, and the talk is mainly going to be a sort of like a historical historical talk, but it will have a very clear and a rather obvious um, um, conservation resonance um, linked really by reason of a, a, um, a sort of recent um, episode or controversy <coughs> um, connected with um, listing uh, uh, with, with, with conservation and, and tower blocks in Aberdeen. Um, and I should just say a few, uh, a few words about that um, just as a kind of um, um, as an introduction to to set the, to the kind of rationale for the the talk, so I really became and uh, although my main research has been on kind of global mass housing, particularly working also on a, on a book on Hong Kong, uh, which is hopefully going to come out in about a year or so, I became involved with Aberdeen Tower Blocks a few years ago at a highly local, place-specific uh, level. <clears throat> when I was approached at a conference in 2018 by some local residents who were worried that their blocks might fall victim to a kind of social cleansing regeneration scheme, like the notorious ones like the Haygate in London, where low-income residents were sort of pushed out by gentrification projects with a kind of public sector aspect, um, dressed up in the rhetoric of social inclusion. And they asked if it might be possible to sort of bolster their defenses against this kind of real estate-led demolition by getting the city centre slab blocks um, listed. And I said I'd see what I could do to help. And the reason for involving me was that the case for listing uh, has to be justified exclusively in terms of the architectural and historic uh, significance of the block, which I, you know, I felt in discussing with them was certainly kind of within my sort of skill set. And this was um, eventually, uh, you know, after lots of ups and downs and so on, was eventually successful in the case of the two sites that were arguably at most at risk of regeneration, which is um, Castle Hill and, and, and Gallowgate. And uh, these are two pictures of Gallowgate here. Um, the line of argument that I sort of followed in the nomination was to argue not that the blocks were some kind of like poetic works of avant-garde modern masters, but that they were highly local and place specific um, normal housing. Um, and this emphasis on the local facts on the ground um, is actually quite prominent in the mass housing book. And it partly takes its clue, cue from recent developments in, in other areas of history. For example, in, in ancient history, um, there's two authors, Peregrine Horden and Nicholas Purcell, have made a sort of bottom up and reinterpretation of Mediterranean history and Roman history in their book, The Corrupting Sea, which is not so much around sort of grand narratives, but the interactions of innumerable, what they call micro regions, micro regions and micro ecologies. So in architectural terms, that links quite neatly into the time honored idea of the vernacular. Um, it also links up with social and cultural specificities, including in the case of Aberdeen um, uh, at the bottom, the local culture of not only strong civic pride, but also a thrifty carefulness about public assets. Um, and here, um, the isolated controversy that we've had about the city centre towers is arguably an exception that proves the rule. Um, I, I'll come back to Aberdeen at the end, but um, in general, it's taken extraordinarily good care of its public housing assets, tower blocks included, in, in stark contrast to the flagrantly throwaway policies of mass building and mass demolition pursued in most other Scottish cities and well, most other English cities for example, uh, as well, you know, starting just down the road in Dundee. There's Derby Street uh, on its way out there, uh, which has demolished uh, almost all its towers since the late 80s, or Glasgow, Edinburgh, Liverpool, Sheffield, etc., etc. Unlike the profligate waste of built assets and embodied carbon in these places and the often empty and devastated spaces that result, Aberdeen today is actually almost like a, a, an intact museum of post-war social building. And if that's a position that I hope the confirmed listing of the eventually of the five towers will hopefully reinforce. <clears throat> 
But in this lecture, what I want to do is to leave the um, specific case of Aberdeen till the end and to build up to it by progressively narrowing geographic framework of discussion of the cultural and architectural history of modernist public housing, beginning with the widest international context, <clears throat> and then within that proceeding to the huge diversity of national and local variants. And here, um, I think we can say as an advanced installment of that, council housing in Britain was one of the most distinctive local variants of all. In Britain, there's a very use of this term council housing <clears throat> instead of public housing indicates it was actually built and rented out directly by local government, by councils like Aberdeen Corporation, a, a national system um, uh, that's not really found anywhere else in the world. You saw that's the, the illustration of Aberdeen being thrifty at the bottom and um, Dundee and Glasgow at the top not being thrifty. And here we get onto, onto, um, onto the kind of British speciality of, of, of council housing. So um, in, in Britain, as, uh, it, the, the council housing as a term indicates, it was actually built and rented out directly by local government. Um, so in its organization, its central decision makers were local politicians, elected politicians, and it became bound up with a local political and civic microcultures to an extreme degree. Um, council housing in Britain was also distinctive in how it was physically shaped, especially in its huge stress on, on, on slum clearance, <clears throat> which encouraged demolition as a default mode of operation for state housing intervention. And elsewhere in the world, very different patterns normally prevailed, as I'll explain later. But first, I want to take a quick look at the overall mass housing movement at an international level. And I should emphasize that as my research has concentrated on the post-war period, when um, mass housing generally meant modernist mass housing, the same is also true for this uh, lecture. So um, let's first of all sketch out some very general themes at a global level, then homing in eventually to Britain, Scotland and Aberdeen. And I hope you're seeing there a slide that says mass housing across the world um, with four pictures on it. Um, so most buildings built in the 20th century across the world were individual houses or informal dwellings built by the inhabitants themselves, like in shanty towns and so on. Whereas the housing complexes I'm concerned with here are very different. Um, they were shaped by the collective interventions of the modern state responding to urgent political and economic pressures and ideals and their often monumental built form broke increasingly sharply from 19th century patterns under the revolutionary influence of, of, the, of the modern movement. Especially after 1945, mass housing developments reared up in cities across the world from Moscow to Buenos Aires, from Toronto to Melbourne in a vast wave unleashed by the confluence of the strong modern state and modernist architecture. Um, and for half a century, Almost all com commentaries on this uh, 20th century wave of state-sponsored modernization, like this famous one here by James C. Scott, were agreed on one claim above everything, that mass housing was a phenomenon of overwhelming sameness across the world. <clears throat> Whereas what my um, research has, uh, uh, has uh, suggested is very different, um, that modernist mass housing, far from being a monochrome desert of uniformity, was a global landscape of riotously colorful variety and complexity. Complexity, um, responding both to the diversity of the 20th century state and its strong ideals and to the countless um, permutations of modernist architecture, which is where, of course, we get to the idea of the vernacular. Um, this is a historical story of potentially epic proportions um, and especially in hotspot centers of particular uh, pressure and social need. It's um, paradoxical combination of driving overall force and local diversity arguably goes back to the um, initial emergence of the modern sovereign state and then the subsequent challenge posed by the disembedding forces of the capitalist urban revolution with which provoked more and more kind of state intervention especially in including in low-income housing conditions um, these interventions normally advocated in sort of burning messianic humanitarian language and things like decent housing for all homes for the people you know spiritual language and so on but um, beneath the um, all the lofty rhetoric and the massive housing needs statistics they're also swirled um, urgent and existential fears of social instability um, and revolution with results that often included prioritizing the housing of skilled workers rather than the poor as a way of securing their loyalty to the state. And in fact, really one of the most enduring paradoxes within mass housing is the fact that for all the genuine talk of fighting injustice, 
the most effective and long-lasting housing programs actually focused on somewhat better off citizens, whereas attempts to focus on uh, to build directly for the poorest, and especially in the USA, often came to a bit of a premature end. Um, by 1945, social welfare was enshrined as an international as well as national policy goal, and mass housing really became one of the foremost weapons in the armory of the disciplined, the strong state of the mid-20th century and trumpeted in martial slogans like, you know, the war against the slums and so on. And that was the very time that the, uh, the equally dynamic new transnational force of the modern movement emerged in the architecture of housing, which uh, with its claims of sort of uh, um, universal applicability, but also um, providing for local and, and national variety in, in um, place specific interpretation. So the mass housing movement really was at the center of all of this. Um, and um, it constantly, you know, became more and more intense and driving at the same time as broadening out across the world. So you can look at it both chronologically and geographically, which is what I tried to do in the mass housing book. Um, chronologically, mass housing was an epic story. It was a narrative where the first precocious initiatives in a few developed countries were followed by a general explosion of activity in the post-1945 decades, which is where the stress on uh, geographical variety comes in. Um, in the post-war years, with the global standing of communism very much boosted by you know, the USSR's wartime victories, the geopolitical structure of, of social provision, um, including mass housing, took on its mature form. And um, most uh, famously summed up in 1952 by social critic Alfred Sauvie, um, who uh, interpreted the developed world through a binary opposition between uh, the first world of Western capitalists and the second world of the communist bloc. And um, contrary to um, all the later claims, like um, by Scott, of, of uh, top-down homogeneity, by the 60s, most states in these first and the second worlds had developed their own distinctive pattern of social housing production, energized by strong um, state uh, control and new uh, collective values. Um, in the second world, these tended to focus on communist social engineering. In the first world, on the social ideals of, of soft nationalism. And this really encouraged a huge variety of financing and organizational regimes, um, including like private philanthropic co-op agencies enjoying state support or direct agencies of the state, whether you know, uh, area based or like functionally based, like the housing projects that were directly built by government factories and enterprises under, under communism. Um, and there's also constant debate about, you know, who should be the recipients of this sort of the housing. Um, balancing affordability and the ethical prioritization. Um, architecturally, too, um, individual countries develop their own variants of the, the supposedly universal formulae of international modernism. <clears throat> the most pressing were basic choices of building pattern, like um, between high apartment blocks and single family, family dwellings, or between straightforward new development on city peripheries and um, the kind of specialism of Britain, the surgical slum clearance in the inner cities. Now, obviously, um, you know, post-war mass housing architecture was ultimately shaped to some extent, a bit, by the avant-garde concepts of modernist pioneers like people like Le Corbusier or later on the Team 10 grouping with all their kind of, you know, dense cluster planning and so forth. But far more immediate and I would say rather more important are um, kind of impersonal factors like land control, density pressures or building industry organization. Um, on the ground, um, mass housing architecture simplified and mixed together the main elite concepts, especially tall towers and slabs and open space, in countless local permutations. Um, some of them perpetuated elements from pre-modernist phases of housing, including, for example, staircase access to so-called sectional plans that are very like our uh, 19th century tenements here, here in Scotland, into uh, uh, and which really became um, 
the main the normal um, standard form of housing layout in the USSR of like a staircase flats on each side, another staircase flats on each side and just add a lift to it and just extend it ad infinitum. Um, or on the other hand, the external gallery access blocks of 19th century philanthropic London, which mutated after 1945 into a more um, avant-garde variant called deck access with you know, the Smithsons, etc. And then the dominant everyday pattern in places like the Netherlands, where it was called called Chalereibau, um, or um, and or on the right here is in Singapore, where it's the same sort of thing, really. Um, now, very often <clears throat> in Western countries, uh, all these programs were kind of advocated in rather enlightenment language of universal rights and ideals and stuff. But alongside these, the strongest driving forces of mass housing production were often locally specific political processes and emergency pressures and um, within authoritarian states this sort of politicization of homes for the people often was very much a sort of blatant propaganda character but the same applied rather more subtly in democratic systems for example in the you know, things like the in sweden the folk hymn or the million program uh, the 1960s and 70s which had a lot of really quite heady rhetoric attached to it um, overall governments have almost invariably offered mass housing aid to those who support or acquiescence they've needed rather than those in the worst need. And that, that's a situation that seems likely to continue in the wake of the downfall of state socialism and, uh, and the decline of the Western welfare state. As historians Mark Swenerton and uh, Tom Avermant asked in, in 2015, will this be the story of the 21st century in housing, welfare state building without the welfare state? So let's now go on to look at how this local diversity manifested itself overall. First looking at how mass housing was organized and then at the built forms it took on the ground, um, narrowing um, in each case to focus eventually on the story of Britain and then finally on the case of Aberdeen. Um, so across the developed world, the most normal pattern of social housing that developed during the earlier and mid 20th century, and it certainly in the, in the first world, um, was an arm's length decentralized approach via semi-public agencies, social companies, or housing cooperatives, sometimes big and sometimes small. Um, in most um, continental European countries, both before uh, and in the Western countries after World War II, the emphasis was on a kind of continuity with uh, the 19th century private patterns of housing rather than breaking from them via uh, government enabling of private or philanthropic efforts and or social housing companies. And there's really a vast um, diversity of approaches, both between and within nation states and both organizationally and architecturally. But what um, still uh, predominated on the whole was non-municipal solutions. And we've got to start having council housing in the back of our mind, you know. Um, so what was mainly dominant, um, you know, in places like Sweden and so on was not council housing. Um, and ranging from um, things like Belgium, where the predominant thing was like subsidized private builders, uh, West Germany, Sweden, Denmark, was sort of social housing companies and, and uh, co-ops, I and mean, some of them very large, like the, the HSB in, in Sweden, or the um, latterly rather infamous Neue Heimat in, in, in West Germany. Um, politically, while social democratic regimes tended to be sort of prevalent in the Nordic countries, elsewhere, uh, the driving forces of mass housing could equally just as easily be right of centre. Um, uh, for example, in the many Christian democratic controlled governments like Italy in the 40s and, and 50s. So that's the mainstream. But council housing was really very different from this. Um, the leading early example of council housing wasn't actually in Britain, but in Austria, which was the militant um, city municipality of Red Vienna uh, in the 20s, whose housing, um, social democratic housing, memorialized itself through huge inscriptions and massive courtyard blocks, and then um, carried, it was sort of revived to some extent after um, World War II, although the, the, the biggest one in uh, post-war, Alter La, and the, the bottom right is actually uh, built by housing association, so it actually doesn't count. Um, now, Great Britain, though, was unique in uh, giving uh, local municipal authorities the lead role in the national housing drive, um, and, and that is directly planning and building and managing local uh, large social housing stocks. Um, now, of course, this approach 
uh, was originally indebted to something that um, I, I think is, you know, not in terms of the overall history of public housing, is not internationally very well known, which is that the absolute world pioneer uh, was Ireland, um, whose uh, Labourers Act housing at the turn of century had pioneered a national local authority based housing programme, but in a, a rural setting. And that was for largely for political reasons. It was kind of like a, a unionist ploy to try and combat nationalism by, by sort of uh, building, rebuilding what were already very well housed uh, rural laborers in, in even better housing, um, but done by the, under the aegis of the local authorities. Uh, but council housing in Britain was far larger in scale. And um, as I say, the way it was organized is described literally in the name council housing. Um, following its large scale launch in uh, 1919, the system achieved remarkable out put figures already, but after World War II, even these were eclipsed. And um, between 1945 and 65, council housing accounted for 58% um, of all new dwellings, um, twice the interwar percentage, and that's over Britain uh, uh, overall. Now, the um, highly um, concerted yet uh, decentralized character of council housing, uh, and with its whole you know, being sort of bound up with local authority autonomy and pride, made sure housing remained a burning list, um, or Norwich, which was controlled by largely the city architect David Percival and his design ethos. And then on the other hand, authorities like Salford or Liverpool or Dundee, who were controlled by politicians who were set on maximum output and which followed engineering and contractor-led design approaches, you know. Um, but there were negative aspects to this council housing system too. I mean, post-war council housing system in Britain was a direct extension of local gesture politics, uh, which could create tremendous civic diversity on the one hand and, 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 and motivation and, you know, vernacular uh, patterns on the ground, but it could also lead to wild swings in policies with changes in political control and often, you know, frankly, ridiculous amounts of overbuilding in unwanted places. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, um, basically, I mean, post-war council housing, you know, it could, there's a lot of kind of civic motivation, a lot of like vernacular diversity, but um, ridiculous amounts of overbuilding and then mass demolitions. And uh, you, you only need to think of Whitfield and Dundee, you know, I mean, why was it built? And then, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or Ardler. And it could also allow hostile interventions by central governments to be made far more easily than in, in places where there wasn't municipal housing, like in the 1980s under Mrs. Thatcher. Um, you know, that wouldn't have been possible in Scandinavia or something like that. They wouldn't have been able to sort of order local authorities to hand over all their, their housing revenue accounts and all that kind of stuff, whereas it could just be confiscated in, in, in Britain. Um, while it was only in Britain as a whole, especially after World War II, that council housing became a massive uh, nationwide phenomenon, its role was strongest uh, um, in, um, uh, uh, here in Scotland, where overall per capita public housing output from 1945 to 70 was twice that of England and Wales. And by the early 60s, the proportion of all new housing production directly built and managed by public agencies, which is 80%, um, was, was much higher than any other Western country compared, for example, with 2% in West Germany or 0.3% in Belgium. Um, and that public, the public agencies are actually a slight anomaly included council housing. It also included this minority thing called the Scottish Special Housing Association, which I don't have time to talk about today, but it built about 10% of all new housing and uh, um, most local authorities hated it. But anyway, um, and um, um, but also um, all new housing production, the, the proportion was actually higher than the USSR or East Germany. Um, in Glasgow, um, between 1960 and 1975, 95% of all new housing was council built. Um, and um, um, like in, in, the, in the Soviet Union, it was something like 65% because there was a lot of like building of co-ops and you know stuff like that. Um, People like Glasgow Corporation's crusading housing convener, David Gibson, and there we can see him on the right in that photo at the bottom there of the housing committee, of the, which is the powerhouse of Glasgow Corporation. That's in 1962 or something, I think. Um, they were specially opposed to the planning led agenda of the post-war years, which aimed at reducing the population of the big cities through overspill to new towns and elsewhere. And they became convinced that packing in tall towers offered a way of saving their cities from what they saw as this sort of um, um, kind of fifth column attack. 
um, housing as local politics was something uniquely strong in Britain, and that included the local political agenda of fighting um, sort of professionally planned population loss. Now, other um, Anglophone countries like the USA or Australia or New Zealand shared some of the features of council housing without going in for generalized municipal control, and with other rather different features like a stress on state promoted home ownership, that was um, particularly strong in Australia and New Zealand, and the state tended to provide public housing housing not by local councils, but by semi-autonomous housing authorities or um, commissions. So there's down at the bottom is the Victoria Housing Commission. And um, I think in the, um, uh, yeah, the top right there, that's another estate in Melbourne. And that's um, uh, the Ministry of Housing and Construction. I think that's kind of um, not quite sure how, um, I think they took over from the Housing Commission when it got abolished. Um, and then um, in the US, um, there's a, uh, uh, public housing tended to be built by city housing authorities that were kind of connected with, but sort of a one remove from the city councils, and which were focused on rather utilitarian multi-story blocks, sometimes in, uh, arranged in very strange layouts, not all uh, not aligned with each other and sort of um, whatever. Um, after World War II, uh, public housing soon ran out of steam when confronted by McCarthyism and kind of racial tensions. From around 1950, the US began its sort of prolonged retreat from it, other than in New York City, where for very special reasons, the role of public housing and planning in the city and the city's housing authority, uh, the famous NYCHA, uh, remained and still remains um, very, very strong. And they also benefited from another, like a kind of hybrid public uh, um, pr um, public um, program called the mitchell Lama program, which uh, uh, was accounted, for example, for Co-op City at the top. So um, that brings us on to built form which uh, includes you know where the housing was built and in what what form now in the location of public housing efforts in most european countries the normal pattern especially in mediterranean countries was that the poor, the poorest older housing was built on the city uh, was on the city outskirts and therefore most public housing was built there too with limited demolition in the inner city and the, you know basically all that needed to be cleared away basically on the outskirts were kind of kind of scruffy like shanty or odd shanty towns or what were called bidonville or lotisme in, in 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 france so in places like rome or milan which were ringed by kind of post-war shanty towns um, you know new mass housing was overwhelmingly built in those zones too um, in france um, you know the big bugbear was the bidonville um, those peripheral projects involved post Beaux-Arts type layouts of axial slabs and huge long like you know prefabricated rational construction the so-called grand ensemble um, which were mass produced on a large scale and also were widely exported and we'll see in a sec to the ussr um, but also within western europe <clears throat> but the same also applied to wel uh, wealthier welfare state countries in scandinavia and elsewhere Again, almost with no slum clearers, but instead with vast outer developments, including the cleverly designed high quality industrialized building systems in Denmark and Sweden, which were combined with meticulous design and landscaping in Sweden, mainly medium and high rise flats, but in Denmark, uniquely having a program of low rise, high density prefabricated uh, um, architecture. Now in the Soviet socialist bloc too, um, the architectural form taken by the mass egalitarian uh, programs of housing was far closer to the French ensemble than to British inner urban slum clearance, especially after Khrushchev's mid-50s shift to a standardized industrially produced uh, approach. Um, the particular pattern generalized in the, the Soviet bloc um, owed a lot in particular to uh, French mass housing modernist principles, including these actually planned or enormously long blocks and kind of schematic forms like like big curves and um, whatever, um, medium height usually, great length, and set in very wide um, expanses of space. And the ones on the left are in, in uh, Yesenyevo in Moscow, which is actually very near the headquarters of the FSB. And then there's the famous SNIP in the middle, which are the kind of Soviet norms of housing construction that everybody had to adhere to. And then on the right, there's two um, um, two uh, estates from, from Kiev, and including at the bottom is Obolon, which is where the um, Russian army made its unsuccessful attempt to dash into the center of um, Kiev um, a, um, a few weeks ago. Um, so the extreme emphasis on type plan um, standardization <clears throat> and prefabrication led to a very different, um, more coarse grained landscape than in Western Europe. And a city like Tallinn in Estonia, for example, um, 
the evolution of successive generations of block types is very, very legible, like kind of annular rings in a tree, but in a local character in the Western sense is a little bit kind of absent. Um, within um, Central and Eastern Europe, while the closest satellites of the USSR, like Poland and East Germany, Czechoslovakia, kind of resemble each other fairly closely, one or two others, like Yugoslavia and Romania, uh, diverge sharply, and in particular, Yugoslavia's um, idiosyncratic self-management political system generated wildly eccentric built outcomes, combining Western architectural individualism and socialist grand planning, but still very much peripheral, you know, developments on the outskirts. Now, Britain, um, differed very sharply from all of this. Um, Location-wise, Britain resembled the US and um, um, the other Anglophone countries, and traditionally, the worst housing, there was an inner city slum belt around the center, the so-called Chicago school model of urban structure. So many public housing schemes, like in the US and Australia, which are Australia on the right there, um, were built on cleared urban redevelopment sites in the tradition of surgical slum clearance, uh, partly established in city improvement schemes in, in the colonies and so forth. Um, now, now, often these slum clearance developments, which are known by various names, for example, slum reclamation in Australia, um, took the form of high towers as well as uh, long uh, slab blocks, which was something that then had massive resonances later um, in the public housing programs of Hong Kong and Singapore, which were also organized on the Anglophone um, housing authority um, uh, model. And here, for example, are the standard 41-story um, harmony blocks, so-called, that became the um, staple fare of Hong Kong public housing from 1988 onwards. These are all designed by kind of expat architects and so forth. Um, now, in Britain, um, Although the peripheral garden city model stayed a very important one and actually got a new lease of life in the New Towns programme, which were insulated organisationally from the local authorities, Nevertheless, in urban housing, the role of slum clearance was especially exaggerated, and it was uh, dominated by the large <clears throat> urban municipal authorities. And in fact, it was inter in integrally bound up with the organizational reliance on direct municipal building and ownership. Uh, partly, all this was because the early suppression of private landlords had caused faster housing decay than in many other countries. Partly, it was fueled by the sort of tradition in Britain of polemical debates about urban conditions. But for whatever the reason, the municipalities piled up all these powers of slum clearance. And although the um, you know the late 19th century, you know, the early 20th century, there'd been a few clearances, what followed 1945 was really totally different. You know, gigantic demonstrations of municipal power just ripping down vast expanses that looked as if they'd been area bombed by the RAF and if they'd been in Germany. Um, um, except they hadn't, um, and then rebuilding them on, on completely new um, layouts. So that's Manchester, not Hamburg. And this um, focus on the inner urban helped to generate a very distinctive architectural outcome, um, an idiosyncratic uh, vernacular of, of, of modern housing with multi-story blocks in kind of clumps, um, usually not system built, um, unlike the uh, lines and lines of prefabricated slab blocks on the city edges that were typical of France or the USSR. <clears throat> the irony was that the dwellings being cleared, or an irony, um, in, in places like Manchester or West Ham or Glasgow, you know, let, uh, which are kind of branded as being among the worst in the country sort of thing, let alone kind of North Kensington or St Pancras or places in London where there were kind of, there was slum clearance, but, you know, well, you know, what the problems were, who, you know, um, they were not especially low quality by international standards by comparison with the USSR or Hong Kong or even Berlin or, or Vienna. And uh, there's an interesting little sidelight on that as early as 1937 <clears throat> by Manchester housing reformer and garden suburb evangelizer E.D. Simon when he was on a, a study visit to the Soviet Union. He commented in Moscow that, quote, it, quote, 90 percent of the families in Moscow could improve their housing conditions beyond recognition recognition if they could have for themselves one of those houses that are being pulled down in Manchester as unfit for human habitation, unquote. And so that's what's what had vanished in the in the top photo there um, by by the 1970. Um, so that tendency towards rather self-contained value systems and the 
implicit anomalies and definitions of standards and quality between different housing systems that are created was, um, I, I would say, yet another consequence of the very diversity of mass housing across the world. The occupants of each micro world, and this is going back to our idea of micro environments or micro worlds, I was talking about at the beginning, um, each one was generally unaware of what was outside, you know, whether it was in how a housing program should be organized or what constituted bad housing conditions and density or number of rooms or facilities. Um, internationally speaking, council housing was a very unusual system rather than the norm. And the rhetoric and the practice of slum clearance of bad housing was based on similarly rather um, insular values and um, criteria. And um, I mean, I remember uh, a, a, um, a, a lecture about um, uh, redevelopment in Glasgow by um, Fra uh, Fraser Stewart, who was the um, um, head of the New Global Housing Association in the kind of 90s. And he said, well, he said uh, you know, housing in Glasgow was renowned for having the worst conditions in the world outside Calcutta. And, you know, quite, you know, to say, uh, begging the question of what the housing conditions were or went in Calcutta. Um, uh, at the the very moment before World War One, uh, the proportion of one room houses in Berlin was sort of like, I think, five times as high as in, in Glasgow, etc, etc. Um, and all these insular values and criteria could lead to a wide variety of outcomes ranging from the crude blanket demolitions and mass rebuilding of places like Salford or Liverpool to the place sensitivity and carefulness of some other places like Aberdeen. And this is where we finally now get uh, to, um, we get to finish by um, returning into focus a bit on Aberdeen in particular. How did it fit into the post-war council housing drive of modernist flats? Well, to begin with, neither it nor its great rival Dundee had the preoccupation of Glasgow of fighting off the threat of planned uh, cuts in population and overspill to new towns. Both Tayside and the Northeast were regarded by the planners as growth areas during the 60s, so both cities' populations could expand slightly in the early post-war years to just under 200,000. But both of them launched into en energetic multi-story building during the 60s and later, highlighting the way that high flats had by then become a rather routine uh, building solution for any city wanting to boost output. The negotiating skills of the formidable Aberdeen city architect, George, George Keith, and the financial acumen and the um, incorruptibility of, of, uh, of uh, Robert Lennox, Councillor Lennox, the long-standing city treasurer, provided a very sound um, political uh, uh, organizational basis for the city's program, unlike the um, chaos and um, uh, corruption that reigned um, down the road in Dundee. Um, although um, Aberdeen had no perceived overcrowding or slum problem on, on the scale of Clydeside, um, its housing condition, which was mainly labour controlled, but every so often was led by the popular um, Tory or the uh, Progressive Party uh, battling Bailey, Frank McGee, uh, had, they set their hearts on a major multi-storey drive after they visited Roehampton and Glasgow in 1949, and inevitably this being Britain rather than France, involved both uh, inner city uh, slum clearing projects as well as city periphery schemes. Although Aberdeen slum areas, you know, frankly, were mere pockets of unfitness, which would not have been universally recognized as serious slums by the standards of, uh, of Glasgow, um, let alone um, cities in other countries that had really serious housing problems. Um, the Corporation Housing Committee's most um, crusading convener, Councillor Jock Gregg, who is uh, commemorated by Greg Court, um, he would often accost the sit deputy city architect, Tom Watson. He'd say, here's a bit of ground, Tom. How about a multi-story here? Um, the city's high flats, almost all designed by um, Keith and Watson staff rather than contractors, and almost none of them involving large panel system building other than at Seton, <clears throat> fell into two distinct and logical categories. Um, first of all, the peripheral or suburban point blocks, and then the slab-like tower blocks in the um, inner clearance areas, which is where we finally reached the uh, recently listed city centre towers. Um, the peripheral towers started off in 1959 to 61 with the isolated schemes at Ashgrove 8 and Maastricht 1, uh, building up to larger mixed developments at Hazel Head, which was explicitly inspired by Roehampton, uh, Cornhill, Stockett Hill, and then Tilly Drone Hayton. And it then culminated at Seaton, um, which included uh, nearly over 1,200 high flats. <clears throat> 
Um, the clearance schemes, uh, which are mostly comprising the blocks that are now um, listed, uh, began with Chapel Street and Skeen Street in 1961 and climaxed in the city centre towers of Castle Hill and Gallowgate in the late 60s. Um, these monumental designs were clad with unique granite uh, rubble faced slabs, which was very much uh, uh, brought out in the, um, in the um, 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 listing. Um, justification. Owing to the smallness of the slum areas, some of these towers were partly justified not just by housing need, but by being integrated into a boldly designed inner ring road, creating typically 1960s ensembles of traffic architecture, like you see at the bottom left there. But almost as distinctive as these, but a bit more low key, <clears throat> was the tail end of Aberdeen's tower building drive in the late 70s and 80s, when the council launched into a really unique series of rather lavishly built towers of sheltered housing, um, a unique policy which included Britain's last multi-story council block at Jasmine Place, which was built as late as 1985. And I sort of remember seeing it going up from, you know, watching it from visits to the canteen at the top of St. Nicholas House and uh, on the 13th floor. So I think the um, specifics of this Aberdeen story can help provide a, a valuable counterweight to the narrative of failure and throwaway demolition found elsewhere is two complementary sides of the same argument to highlight the global picture of high common ideals and national and local diversity, including the council housing system in Britain and Scotland, uh, as opposed to others elsewhere, and then focusing specifically on Aberdeen to highlight its um, civic and local uniqueness, both in organization and architecture, as a legacy of the housing giants of the past, like Robert Lennox and John Gregg. Now, you know, in other cities, of course, a legacy of people like these is rubbished by the detractors of post-war housing and by the people who set about under, undermining and then stigmatizing it and branding it as an obsolete monster to be uh, swept aside by snazzy gentrification, in, along with its um, discarded um, low-income um, um, inhabitants. And that's a, a scenario that's been played out um, um, first elsewhere in the, from Scotland in the pressure cooker housing conditions of London and Southeast England, for example, at the notorious regeneration of the Haygate estate and the in London and the dispersal of its community. But it's now potentially popping up just about everywhere. Um, and for example, in Cumbernauld Newtown, um, where the town's entire stock of perfectly good tower blocks, originally built in ironically for executive higher rental public tenants, has been bulldozed in the last um, few years by a housing association that kind of acting as a sort of real estate thing, in effect decapitating the town and rendering it publicly invisible from um, from afar. Um, although I'm glad to see that demolition of the remaining parts of the of the town centre uh, um, is being at least is being challenged by a, um, a, a listing proposal. Though I understand this, that there isn't actually a demolition proposal yet, so which means it, it could get listed. Anyway. Um, as a, in general, as I said at the outset, uh, Aberdeen has had an excellent record in thriftily husbanding its, its housing assets and avoiding demolition gestures, with only a few exceptions where standards have been allowed in the last few years to slip a bit. Uh, for example, at Castle Hill and Gallowgate, and hopefully the upholding of the listing of the five most important city centre slabs, including the, these two sites, will nip in the bud any temptation on the part of the um, um, city authorities to try something different on those high value city centre sites and uh, uh, anything different that might jeopardise the strong local communities that have persisted there, um, despite the management and allocation problems that have um, challenged some of them in recent years. But here, of course, I'm um, straying back out of the field of heritage strictly defined and the, the kind of patch of the IHBC into the area of um, local housing policy and regeneration, where I kind of began my talk as the initial um, impact also for the um, the idea of the listing of the blocks and um, and so at this point um, I think I'll bring my lecture to a close so thank you very much Miles thank you very much that was a, a tour de force I could say uh, whizzing around the world and uh, bringing us back into Aberdeen um, at the end and um, I think you make a very strong case for uh, the local rootedness of architecture, even uh, when it's international modernism that we're talking about. Um, I, I hope that we have a lot of questions, um, although I didn't see any that uh, popped up in the chat so far. So um, I think if people would like to signal somehow that they have a question for you, that they do that um, by waving 
a digital hand or um, by, by typing a question into the chat column. Um, as there is none, I will ask one, which is that if the best public housing was not for the people who had the greatest need for that housing, um, should we be really talking about gentrification? Um, or, or is gentrification a threat? Or is it actually something that ought to be um, in the right circumstances welcomed um, if it's a means of getting people to appreciate their historic environment um, even when it's relatively recent? Because that, that is part of uh, the country's heritage. Yes, I mean, I think um, gentrification, if it's part of a, a relatively compressed sort of, um, if, if, if you get somewhere that has been down for a long time, I think that's a kind of different matter. But if you get something like in Aberdeen, where you, you know, previously, my recollection of Aberdeen from the 80s was that any multi-story block, if you went into it, would have, you know, like carpets, little tables in every floor uh, and um, um, potted plants and that kind of thing. And um, something happened in and it, probably to do with allocation policy or something uh, to do with those specific um, schemes um, that sent them into a little bit of a tailspin. And I think it's just where you get the London experience seems to be that you can get things going into a rapid cycle of that sort of thing happening and, um, and then um, demolition. And there's a similar case in Rochdale at the moment where there's um, a, five, uh, a line of seven tall tower blocks called Fallinge B um, on the on the um, just by the, the town centre where there's a um, where some of the blocks are, are, are still occupied but there's a strong pressure now running down um, several of them and the idea of knocking them down and possibly selling off the land so um, I, I mean I, I I wouldn't want want to make any any a kind of general um, uh, a, a generalization about it. I mean, but certainly areas that are gradually going down could you, gentrification in place. Maybe this is a very architectural view, but is possibly different from gentrification, including demolition, as in the case of the <clears throat> Haygate and what the inhabitants of the Aberdeen blocks were afraid might happen. Um, because it 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 partly it it it, it involves less carbon um, waste of in, embodied carbon, um, and partly because it's possibly a more gradual um, process. Um, so it's not really. I, I'm not against. I mean, I, I know there are people who would criticise me saying this, but I'm not. I'm not against gentrification overall. I mean, that's you know, um, um, that's been a driving motor in the improvement of a lot of 19th century areas. Um, you know. In, from the 70s and 80s and, and so forth. What I'm really against are these kind of pl almost planned, pre-planned regeneration schemes where an area is run down almost deliberately, and, but one, you know, one can't say that because you just don't know what's going on behind the scenes, and then uh, leading to demolition and then snazzy new buildings going up afterwards. So it's not a really an a, a blanket opposition to gentrification, whether of local authority areas or, or, or whatever. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not a housing policy specialist, so um, I, I don't want to say too much about it because I know that I'm just talking through my hat to some extent. Uh, there's a question from Douglas Campbell. Um, yeah. Would you like to hear it from him? Or well, I mean, I, 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 can, yeah, or... I can see it in the chat. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I certainly think it's relatively little to do with architecture. Um, I mean, again, I'm not a housing policy specialist. So, you know, what makes housing successful? That's probably, you know, housing managers and housing, but obviously the housing managers in Aberdeen would have said, oh, you know, uh, Castle Hill is not successful. It needs to come down, you know. So, um, you know, um, but, um, but from my point of view, um, I think management is 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 really a key factor in it, and it almost I wouldn't say the architecture almost doesn't matter, but um, you know architectural patterns that are in in some contexts are labelled as being you know impossibly alienating and so on, uh, with a different um, occupancy and management and so on can you know I mean uh, 
certainly the discourse of you know impossibly high density that uh, um, uh, in um, for example in England in the late 1960s uh, when the turn away from high-rise flats happened towards more low-rise and low density it was said you know uh, the, the, and Alice Coleman and people like that in the 80s said, you know, there are some densities above certain densities, it's impossible to have civilized life. And, you know, anybody who visits Hong Kong will know that's a lot of absolute garbage. Uh, and that's not because of some nebulous thing about, oh, you know, Asian people are just used to living together, packed close together and so on. But, you know, but uh, high high density, um, very ultra high rise flats can work perfectly well. Um, but, um, yeah, so... Um, but I, I think less successfully is, is usually linked to management and to how, the, how they're run. Um, I've seen Diane's thing. Well, I am. The next thing is I'm trying to get this book on Hong Kong published, but um, and that's a much more in-depth thing. That's based on a lot of very in-depth um, research into um, um, our, our pub, the archives of the, um, the Hong Kong government and uh, which are operated on the same system as here of 30-year uh, rules. So, you know, currently up to, up to 1992. Um, but there are obvious difficulties now. I mean, not at least the difficulty getting there because of COVID, and, 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 um, but, but equally um, now the politicization of things. So, that, you know, the, the issue of where would you stop uh, how do you deal with if it's a general history of public housing? Should it tactfully stop in the you know the you know before the the um, uh, chief executiveship of Carrie Lam uh, to avoid saying you know offending somebody you know um, so um, should it, should it actually be just about the colonial period and end in 1997? But that would be a shame because there's a lot of um, big continuities and um, kind of cause and effect things crossing over the 1997 <clears throat> division. So. But anyway, yes, that should be published in the next couple of years or so. Um, but um, yeah, and then question um, from Mark Douglas or Point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hi, hi, Miles. It's just a, a sort of quite a very interesting talk. I'm just asking a question really wearing a sort of post rental hat and in particular thinking out loud about things like thermal standards and what have you, and clearly. One of the issues about tower blocks is the tower block has to operate as a single unit. In, you, you can't have individuals doing individual cladding to the outside of their building or something mm. like that. And yeah. it, 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 I just have a slight concern that some of these tower blocks were built with a fairly limited life originally. That's not to say that they aren't capable of um, continuing for many years to come. But if we expect better thermal standards, better fire standards, etc. cetera. Um, mm. What are the implications of that if we have a listed building um, where perhaps external cladding is not an option? Is it possible yeah. to improve them internally? To meet yeah, the well, that was actually, standards? yeah. Um, well, funnily enough, that was one of the... Um, the things that were in the back of the mind of the local of the of, of the um well the the ladies from Aberdeen who got me going on the on the on the on the on the on the, on the slab blocks, <clears throat> they had already twigged that uh, whereas it was possible to do um, well uh, in the in the case of Seaton possibly slightly unsightly overcladding but also but equally it could be more sensitively done of um, putting insulation on the outside of a block with blocks that like those that had uh, like a framed an external frame type. Um, construction and that's obviously not not possible really and um, they were worried that that might make the, those blocks uniquely in the city uh, targets for instead let's demolish them and um, and and so they said well but the best way to try and stop that is to get them listed and so in fact you know the, and the listing proposal the, my, the proposal designation proposal um actually made a virtue of uh, because of this architectural distinctiveness of the very feature that made them difficult to potentially to overclad and to and to bring up to energy standards but obviously the problem's still there about the energy standards you know, even though they're listed but um you know, it's it's obviously been managed in Roehampton, which is the same sort of uh, the the um, or the uh, um, Roehampton Lane. So, um, it, it, with a relatively restricted number of blocks, it can't be um, too intractable a problem. And then blocks that don't have you know um, don't have things projecting forward from the then it, you know you can there's a but again I, I'm not a an, I'm not a, a, um, a retrofit engineer so. <laughs> I don't know. But clearly, you know, some the whole retrofit industry um, in Britain, which in many other countries seems to work 
quite nicely and to be con you know controlled in the if they're in germany for example where very large numbers of, of large panel blocks have been uh, have been um Reclad, but in a rather kind of um, subtle way, you know, and that, uh, which uh, you know certainly as that energy uh, uh, brings energy efficiencies, but without completely wrecking the blocks. Obviously, in in England, um, or well, not here, the the um, that entire movement headed off in a rather on its own in a rather catastrophic direction, as end, ending up with a, a Grenfell. Um, so, um, but it's certainly as you know, in, in in most other countries in Europe, seems to be possible to do this without r ripping the blocks to bits. Yeah, no, I, uh, thanks, Mark. I just have a concern that with the you know recent energy increase, significant energy increases both now and in the near yeah. future. Then there is a real danger that the, the people, the very people in the building who are, you know, who are there, are actually going to be penalised potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on, uh, and you know, I don't know how that balances out. I mean, I think it's you know, listing is done in a particular way for a particular reason, and I, I fully understand that. Um, but I think that there is an issue which needs to be sought through. Um, and wearing my architect and previously um, sort of conservation officer hat. I presume that somebody had had a look at the buildings before listing to determine what work could be carried out to, um, to do that upgrade without having an adverse impact because yeah. simply to say, no, you can't do anything, I think would be very difficult. No, in my, my main interest in the uh, blocks, you, the, the Aberdeen thing is a little bit of a um, of a kind of um, a rogue thing on my part because uh, because I'm very keen Aberdeen, and Vega, but in general, I'm not the whole thing about trying to preserve the modernist towers by famous architects, you know, Robin Hood Lane, that, you know, that, that leaves me cold. But, but I think uh, that tower blocks as embodied energy, um, um, as, as an asset to, uh, you know, which is what Aberdeen has done very well on the whole, and, and not just throwing those away. Um, um, you know, I, I think it should be possible to somehow manage that and especially as the number of tower blocks has been reduced to such a small number in in some places i mean when i was researching the tower block book in the late 80s the only place that had demolished a very significant proportion of its blocks was liverpool that had already knocked down um 25 percent of its tower blocks um but now obviously you know many cities you know and it leads to the impression of huge disparities um, where in, in, in cities that actually had kind of the same number of tower blocks, you would think that people would go and say, why did, why did Leeds build so many tower blocks, but Sheffield built almost none? Well, the answer is, you know, uh, Sheffield actually had once had as many tower blocks as Leeds and Dundee had as many tower blocks as Aberdeen, but they, they don't know. And so when you've only got like five or six tower blocks, it's, it's a little bit of a niche problem, you know, then, <laughs> um, sadly. Does uh, Park Hill in Sheffield point to a, a listed building which has yeah. been gentrified and yeah. uh, now it's lovely bright colours and yeah. I hope that there has been some improvement to its thermal efficiency and yeah. is, does that help to demonstrate that a listed building doesn't stop you from doing that in a creative yeah. way? Yeah, I'm sure that's the case. I mean, I Certainly the Park Hill thing seems, I mean, I haven't really been following it in detail, but there seems to have been a pretty protracted saga and bits of it have been done in different ways from other bits. And, uh, um, but um, yeah, I mean, Park Hill is, is definitely uh, an example of a sort of niche thing that, you know, Sheffield has gone ahead and not, Sheffield had used to have a marvelous variety of um, multi-story blocks and all, you know, the whole Womersley regime and um, different, um, I mean, I remember um, Harold Lambert, the, 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 the housing chairman of, um, uh, <clears throat> housing committee chairman of uh, saying, you know, it was like walking around, Sheffield made him so proud. It was like walking around Rome with its seven hills and you had, uh, you had Woodside with its towers soaring up up and then you had uh, Park Hill with all its slabs, you know, and now really it's just Park Hill. So, you know, to some extent, you know, they, they can afford to pick away at Park Hill in a sort of detailed way because virtually everything else is gone. Yeah. Uh, would Dawn like to say something? She's commented that Historic Environment Scotland offered to work oh, yeah. with Aberdeen City Council to explore an energy efficiency project. Ah, uh, and they, yeah, yeah, they look yeah, yeah. forward to some uptake from the council yeah. on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I assume that um, this arm's length thing with the, um, the the fact that the housing stock in Aberdeen is managed by this sort of agency of the city council must mean that, um, I mean, it's not like um, 
you know, Glasgow Housing Association or sanctuary or something of a, of a of of something where the, all the public housing has been dumped in this this agency that's just been left to go berserk. Um, so you know, it, Aberdeen City Council should be able to be, if if it goes on these sites, goes back to its more sensible, normal thing of husbanding assets, it should be able to, hopefully, take that up. I mean, that sounds like an excellent idea. Oh, hi. Hi there. Um, yeah, it was just to, that it was part of our discussions the whole time. And um, certainly there was no opposition to exploring ways to do that mm -hmm. in, a, um, um, you know, with the listing in place or not. Um, yeah. So um, and mm -hmm. we would we it's kind of the next it's the next phase of our research that we would like to, you know, mm -hmm. work with an authority. So it seemed like a good opportunity to work with um uh, the um, the corporate landlord because the listing was being discussed there was a barrier to that discussion um, mm. I think what they really wanted to know is whether or not the buildings were going to be listed and they were opposed to it very quite you know they were opposed to listing from very early on um, so I think that we needed to get through the process of the appeal mm. before we could have any kind of um, sort of calm discussions about what could happen next Mm. Um, although we did work with the council as well to uh, help them um, devise a list of building consent management plan, which is published, and that was published r shortly after the listings um, were put in put in place. <clears throat> um, so there's been certainly a lot of discussion with the council and a lot of um, sort of a lot of will on behalf of HES to do that work. Um, and I mean, and yeah, because I mean in Aberdeen. Um, it's the fact that on the one hand there's the listed blocks but then the fact that there's alongside this there's this huge stock of well-maintained and intact stuff that really is unparalleled elsewhere i mean aberdeen would be like an ideal place to do something like that because there's yeah. all the basic stock is in such good condition and there's the listed ones that are, that are their little problem area um and they could kind of analyze the two in a kind of if they were, if there was the willingness on their side, in, in an integrated way, and it would, you know, because there's very few other places now which have a, a large stock of council housing that that can actually serve as a kind of, you know, a, a test bed, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I suppose so, another yeah. thing, in, in many other places, the um, so much housing stock's been privatized as well, whereas um, I would guess in Aberdeen that quite a lot of the flats, at least, haven't been. Um, so, you know, they maybe have more of it anyway, you know, so I don't know, yeah. I, I have a, a query about Paisley um, yeah. and the, the habit that seems to have occur there of putting something like pagoda roofs on, mm -hmm. on top of some of the towers that you see from the M8. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, is is that think... generally needed or is it just trying to show, look, we've put some money into our public housing? Yeah, I mean, the pagoda roofs are the place I think is the absolute redoubt of those is North Lanarkshire, um, um, where I think every single tower block in North Lanarkshire has one of these um, silly roofs on it. And um, those were all done during the sort of postmodern period. It was sort of, part, I, I think, to some extent, they're postmodern architectural gestures. Whether they've got a practical reading or whether there was roof water leakage from the, the roof, or, you know, I mean, in, in which case, why are other places not? not all been doing it as well um but um on the other hand though as as seen in the um hutchison town b blocks in glasgow where there were kind of slightly you know equally silly kind of like uh, fake pediment things were put on in the in the 80s and then were removed again when the when there were that that the current sort of gray um scheme uh, rehab scheme was put through um those the the silly roofs usually can come off i mean i think they put on pitched roofs on uh, the spence hutches and town c didn't they but then they only came off when the blocks came off as well but um yeah i i wonder if still game is going to see a, a, a resurgence of interest in tower blocks just as coronation street might have helped the terrace mm. streets of manchester <laughs> Um, have we any other questions? In, in that case, um, I think maybe we should wrap up. But thank Miles for a, a really fascinating talk and um, really got us thinking about
and something which is often in the background. Oh, we do have a question or a, um, yes. Matthew Ashton, can, can you unmute yourself? Or do I have to do it? And Dawn as well. No, they're clapping hands, Mark. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm clapping. Oh, right. <laughs> Silly me. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. That was that was your round of applause. Um, everybody could unmute themselves, perhaps, and, and clap. In that case, um, yeah, I don't think I need to make make give permission for that to happen. But but thank you very much, Miles. It was great.